Hey there, Robonzo here. My guest for this episode is LA-based musician Miles Franco. We talk about balancing work between multiple projects and how he re-established himself after relocating from San Jose, California to LA. SoCal. Let's do it. This is the Unstarving Musicians Podcast. I'm your host, Robonzo. This podcast features conversations with me and indie music artists. Conversations intended to help other indie musicians be better at marketing, business, the creative process, and all the other things that empower us to do more of what we love. Make music. I want to say thanks to everyone who supports this podcast. The whole thing is intended to help independent musicians. Help them through a curation of expertise, expertise of other musicians and industry professionals. If you're loving the podcast, if you support the cause, visit unstarvingmusician.com forward slash crowd sponsor to learn about the various ways that you can offer your support. And by the way, if you're a listener of the podcast, I consider you a supporter, especially if you share it with a friend. Again, that's unstarvingmusician.com forward slash crowd sponsor to learn how you can get involved as a supporter. Have you heard of Banzoogle? They power websites for musicians around the world, including Grammy winners. Their easy-to-use system will get you online fast. They have tons of mobile-friendly templates to help you customize your design and site content. It's built for musicians by musicians. Banzoogle makes it easy to sell merch, grow your email list, integrate your socials, and they offer support from a musician-friendly team seven days a week. Plans are affordable. Go to banzoogle.com to start your 30-day free trial. Use the promo code Robonzo to get 15% off your first year. Again, that's banzoogle.com, promo code Robonzo, R-O-B-O-N-Z-O. Miles reminds me a little bit of me. He gigs with a number of bands. He's in demand. He's balancing. Well, I don't mean to say I'm in such high demand, but he's uh, he's balancing things, his uh, a day job and uh, music, multiple bands. I know that's not easy. It takes a little planning. I was that way in the Dallas-Fort Worth and Silicon Valley areas for a number of years. Miles, however, is spending his time focused on original projects. Smart kid. Shout out to my pal George Brandau for connecting us. He's the connector. Hell of a drummer, too. George was featured in episode 22 of this podcast. You should check it out. If you're ever in San Jose, California, try to catch George's band, Chrome Deluxe. Those guys are tight. Miles and Paper Jackets, one of his bands, recently got to do an opening gig for X Ambassadors. That's pretty cool. Miles is pretty cool. I hope one of his bands makes it big. I think it's going to happen. Here's me and Miles Franco. So it looks like you're doing you're you're doing some legitimate stuff now. <laughs> looks like, and I only until a few minutes ago, I actually thought, and it, this may be the case. I thought that gutter daisies was your main thing. I was aware, or I knew that you had some association with paper jackets, but I didn't realize that was one of your your gigs or one of your bands. And then you told me about another one that I I want to talk a little bit about too. All good things. Where did your, I guess, music journey start in terms of playing or recording where, where did it start at well it started when i was pretty young i think it must have been around like i don't know like 11 and 12 around there and uh it, it was one of those things where it's like you know I, I was lucky enough to live on a block that had other kids that were around my age and they're all you know i was like five other boys and we went through phases together and we went through you know the laser tag phase the skateboard phase and eventually we we all like landed on music and you know one one christmas you know everybody's asking for you know guitars and stuff for christmas and at that point i i had already known that my dad was a bass player is a bass player and he had his uh his vintage music band like under the bed and i'd seen it a couple times and he'd let me kind of plank around on it but like now it was cool, right? Now, like, all my friends are getting into music, so I was like, well, I guess, I guess I'll just be the bass player. And I got an amp for Christmas instead. And it was one of those things where it's like, I, I was really into it because all my friends were into it, and all of my friends on that block were older than me. So, you know, my entire young life, you know, child life go- growing up, I was always the, the runt of the group. I was the youngest one, therefore I was the worst at everything. You know, I was, I was like, uh, you know, the smallest, the uh, not as fastest, and so when it came to music, I just kind of just assumed I would pull up the rear. But uh, I would actually, you know, start progressing and learning songs and kind of like getting it down quicker than some of my friends. And I was like, oh, well, maybe maybe this is something I'm good at. And uh, over the years, I kind of just stuck with it. And, you know, some of my friends still play here and there. But, you know, everybody that was on that block with me, they kind of moved on to other things in their life. And 
that was just a moment where I was like, hey, like, this is fun. Like, I'm actually kind of good at this. You know, and then I got into like you know, middle school and high school. There's a whole social aspect to it, too. Mm, yep. That part has not changed in all the years that I've been around music. <laughs> Isn't that funny, right? And so, you know, like I wasn't into sports or anything like that. So obviously, you know, it's like I'm going to do the band thing. This seems like a good way to kind of meet people and uh, and be social and, you know, not have to subscribe to anything that I wasn't wasn't really into. So that it was music was there for me in a social aspect in like in early uh, middle school, high school. But, you know, once again, I found myself progressing and just kind of like trying to play with better players, trying to like, you know, as I infiltrated my local scene of, uh, you know, bands and musicians, it was like, well, I want to play with like some of the best guys that I can. Or, you know, like I want to try to like get a good group together. And every kid has dreams of becoming a rock star. But, you know, I was like, well, you know, let me, I, don't, I never really had delusions of grandeur. I always figured I'd have a day job. But I was like, well, I really just like, I love this music thing. And that's kind of just where it got started. It was just like, you know, in the Bay Area, just like it, just being a kid and trying to get into music and then figuring out that I kind of just like I had a, a natural knack for, you know, certain aspects of just like music. Um, I still can't read, <laughs> still can't read music. But, you know, it's, that's just one of those things where like sometimes uh, certain aspects of a certain hobby will just kind of click with people. And I don't know, you can, sometimes, I, I think people just need to follow that stuff sometimes, you know. Does that mean that you did not do band in, in high school and did not study music or major in music in college? Not not a lot of formal training or just? No, I never had any formal training. I think I had like one guitar lesson and then I think I bailed on the second one and I never went back. I, uh, yeah, I never did any band stuff in school because once again, it was just, it, it wasn't, it wasn't applicable to what I wanted to be doing in music. It was like, you know, I would have to be like playing, you know, in the marching band or in the orchestra. And I just, it, it didn't speak to me. I was very like, no, I want to be doing what I want to be doing. Any time spent doing something else, it just like, it wasn't, it wasn't like, I didn't, I didn't have the heart for it. I was just like, this isn't what drives me. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. I, um, I started out much the same way that you did long ago. And I probably would have done the band thing. I didn't probably would have with the encouragement at home, but I had an older brother who'd been a musician professionally for a short time and it didn't end well. And my parents were kind of hoping I wouldn't do that. So they didn't want me to be in band. And I just took a little bit of elective stuff in college. It's funny. I was just, I was having this conversation today on another interview for the podcast with a, a guy who is a drummer and has, has played for a number of years now and does most of his work on online now. But uh, same thing. He he, a uh, self-taught musician as well. So now, late in life, find myself diving back into reading music. You know, learning to read just for fun and, and the challenge of trying to develop the the vocabulary that I can share with some of the other players that I that I play with. But uh, that's cool. And then, when did you start doing paid gigs or recording on a professional level? Um, I, I want to say that was about like I must have been about twenty or when it really started because you know, the whole way leading up to that it was always just like the thing on the side it was like i was always in a band mm -hmm. and uh, i never really saw it as like a as, a as a you know legitimate means of making a living it was just kind of the thing i did in the bay area but then yeah at, the, at about that age is when i started uh, touring in those local bands and making friends with people in los angeles and that's when i met um a good friend of mine dan murphy who is actually the, the lead singer of all good things and he was in a band called The Good Night. And, you know, they, I thought they were awesome. We played a couple shows on this tour with them. They were really nice guys. And sure enough, you know, uh, one day he hits me up and he's like, hey, our bass player can't do, you know, a thing for one reason or the other. Uh, would you would you like to, you know, play South by Southwest with us? And, you know, at the time I was like, of course. Like I was in my early 20s looking for fun things like that. And he was, you know, willing to throw me some cash. And I was like, yeah, sure. I don't have to pay for gas or food or anything like that. Let's, let's do it. And it was through him that I kind of just got my foot into the Los Angeles music scene and just kind of like, okay, cool. These are people that are really good. I can like come and hang out with them. And a few years after that, I ended up just kind of joining his band and moving out to LA. And then, yeah, and that's kind of how I started getting into just kind of like the LA music scene and like figuring out which bands were like paying for musicians that they needed and kind of just networking and, uh, you know, and it was through a jam scene. I think it was like a local jam scene here where it's like a, there's a thing called like a sun, the Sunset Jam. Mm -hmm. uh, it's at the Viper Room 
out on Sunset. And uh, it, it's, I mean, it's less of a jam in the traditional sense where you think, you know, people show up and just kind of like jam on whatever they can come up with, you know, licks or stuff like that, you know. It's more of like a... It's a little organized. It's a little bit more organized where it's like, you know, it, it, you go up and you play a specific song and you, you sometimes you don't know who you're going up with. But, you know, everybody just stands their parts and you show up and you go on stage and you do the thing and you see how it turns out. But, and, you know, sometimes that's a train wreck, but sometimes it's really good. And there's a lot of really good players. Um, and it was just a great talent pool for me to kind of dive into. And then through that, I met Peter Jacket and I met other bands that, that I'm you know working with or like, you know, playing with now. And it was kind of through that, that I started being like, okay, cool. This is great. Like I found uh, Paper Jackets who needed a bass player. They were willing to, you know, pay me a certain rate for like away gigs and stuff like that. And then, um, when the good night eventually, you know, bands come and go. The good night eventually folded, but I was stayed friends with Dan Murphy because he's such a, a good dude, and uh, he and he was doing some licensing work. Like he was working with these uh, the studio on just kind of writing songs for TV and movies, mm-hmm. and there's good money in that. And so you know, he was kind of like, hey, like I've got this project I'm working on, it's starting to like catch some wind. Like I, I'm, you know, I would love to have you kind of like come in on this because we're looking for another guitar player. And there's some money involved. I was like, yeah, of course, of course, man. So that's kind of how I got into all good things. Cool. So a lot of projects going on. I know you have a day job, and we were talking about before the record button got hit with the Guitar Center headquarters in the Los Angeles area. It sounds like a good gig, too. Have you had moments where you're teetering with doing it full-time, or are you currently at a place where, no, this is cool, I can kind of play do the gigs I want and kind of how I want them and with the day job and it sort of feeds, feeds the music aspirations and it's related and all that. Yeah. I mean, for, right now, I mean, cause like I've gone through so many different phases of, uh, you know, my music career, there's ups and downs and there's been more than a couple of times where, you know, you, you put the dream to rest, you put the dream to bed for a little bit and you go, okay, well let's, let's look at a, like a legitimate career, right? You know, let's look at a, 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 a job, and I've always had guitar center and they've been good to me. But uh, I mean, you know, and like right now, these days, I'm taking a lot of time off to do these gigs and it's kind of becoming like a part time thing. So I toss it back and forth right now. It's like I've got I've got a lot going on. So it's, it's kind of become like a back burner thing. Like, this is just steady money. You know, I come here and I do good work. They let me take these days off to do these gigs. And if the bands that I'm working with stay on the trajectories that they're on. You know, I've got like a good five year plan. So it's something that's kind of constantly in flux. You kind of have to like really hedge your bets. And, you know, life is a gamble either way. But I just know that if I ever needed to, I could always fall back on guitar. And I'd be like, hey, look, I'm going to do a full career out of this. But right now, it's like I am, you know, when I don't have gigs, I do work full time. I work nine to five pretty much here at the office. And, you know, but when I'm busy, I'm not, you know. <laughs> I've got some days off next week where, you know, I'm going to be here for like, you know, maybe two, three days because uh, when I get back from this weekend gig with Paper Jackets, I've got another radio gig with them on a Wednesday. That's cool. And it sounds like a nice place to be. And it's kind of a, a recurring theme with some of the people that I talk to. Um, certainly I have the crowd that I talk to for the podcast that are full time. And today's been a day of talking to well, just a couple of them, but I like talking to I call them educators, but basically people that dedicate their time, some of them musicians and some of them just industry people who dedicate their time to helping um, musicians kind of do it a better way if they're trying to make a a career of it. But um, certainly a lot of the great players that that I've talked to, you know, they have some other career that they do and that's where they're at for different reasons too. Some of them have already done all the other stuff and (laughs) now this is a lot funner for them to, to be able to play on their own terms. So before we started talking, as I mentioned to you, I gravitated toward one of your projects, Gutter Daisies, and I, and I thought that was the one. It's cool to hear about these others in paper jackets and, and all good things. And I was going to ask you about Social Insecurity, the 2017 EP release by uh, Gutter Daisies. Has there been anything with either the other bands that have, have been released since then? Yeah, I mean, Paper Jackets has released, uh, we actually had a, a single come out, a single called Girl. That was uh, Billboard did a, uh, a little write up for us for the music video. It was a couple weeks ago, and that was cool, you know. And uh, we've been kind of steadily releasing stuff. We released a single before that um, when we were on the road called Sticky Icky. That was like a funny little tongue in cheek song. Yeah, that's been fun. And uh, 
that's kind of those two bands right now are releasing probably the most stuff. I know like the gutter daisies right now, uh, the only thing that you, that'll be available is our cover, which is it's a lot of fun. I don't know if you uh, saw that or heard the, or saw the music video. I sure did. It's great. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. For those that are listening, it's a, a cover of the Beastie Boys' Sabotage, and it's very fun. You guys did a great job with it. I'll put a link in the show notes. And you were going to say, sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, um, the Gutter Daisies, we've been recording a lot of stuff, but it's, it's hard because, like, um, so the Gutter Daisies is my passion project. That's the one where, like, I feel it's got the smallest amount of people in it, and we all have, uh, like, the most creative control. So it's, uh, but it, it's also the one that has the least amount of funding. So it's, it's that band, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the one you pour your heart and soul and your extra income into, but it's, it's pure. It's the band that's pure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Are you guys a trio or do you have four, or are there, are there four of you? It's just three of us. Okay. That's what I thought. And, but um, maybe I saw one of your other bands then I saw another one that looked like there was a fourth person, but that's great. What's a, you know, funny thing. In all the years that I've been playing, most of it's been in cover projects and working occasionally with some original artists, but I always love the trio. They're just so much, they're simpler, and I hadn't thought about it as much, but, uh, well, I do. I just think about it a little bit differently, but you mentioned the whole creative element and how, I guess, maybe it's grander. Those weren't your words, but, you know, it's a little grander or bigger because there are three of you with a lot of room to do different things creatively but but my point is just that i've always loved trios because they're so simple and i i guess i like the challenge of the opportunity to make as much sound well not make as much noise as you can but you know like to fill the space with only three players but fill as much space because it's true in a in a in a, in a three-piece each instrument gets a lot of room to kind of like play around you know as a bass player i enjoy it a lot because you know you gotta fill a lot of space it's like if the guitar is not playing you're the only instrument that's like making a melodic sound and vice versa you know if i'm not playing you know the guitar is really carrying it and so both uh, you know doug and i you know he plays guitar and sings i play bass and i sing part-time you know it's like we, we really get a lot of space to play around and uh, anything i do on bass really shines through or sometimes you know if you have two guitar players they're doing so much that sometimes the bass can just like just just sit on those root notes don't move from those root notes but in a in a three piece, I feel like it, there's a little bit of there's there's a little bit of room to kind of just play, uh, you know, melodically, and uh, not have to have to be a little not to be so robotic with uh, some of the simplicity of some of the songs. I have to stop you. I'm looking at one of the. I can't wait to hear your other listen to your other bands. But all good things that there is a 2016 release with 33 tracks on. Are those all? This is not a compilation, but an original uh, 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 compilation of songs. Yeah, so, okay, so all good things. So I was saying earlier about how um, my buddy Dan Murphy, right, he was doing uh, work with the studio to kind of do licensing stuff. So that's how that band really got started. It wasn't really, it wasn't really the, uh, the, the, you know, the plan at the outset was to make a, wasn't to make a band. It was to make songs that were going to get licensed. And, uh, you know, so they were coming out with, you know, that release that has all those songs on it. You'll even find songs on that album that Dan isn't even singing on. So really it's kind of like, there was it was a group kind of like project that they were doing, but then it kind of started catching like a, a lot of plays online, and it started to get a lot of you know started to get attention. On uh, and it was kind of a global thing too. There's a lot of people from Europe and Germany that were listening to it, and that's when they really started like kind of being like, well, maybe we should just kind of make this a band. And that's when um, my buddy Dan hit me up. He was like, you know, I think I think this is really taken off. I've been doing a lot of licensing work with them, but I think we're going to try to shift the direction of this project and try to just make it into a band. Yeah, that's interesting. I I have, so I did an interview with a guy named Lance Harville, and he came on my radar because he played for Rex Brown for his first solo album, uh, Rex from from Pantera, and so Lance. <laughs> it's kind of funny, you know, he's done all this great work, but it's stuff that you can't find anywhere because it's all, you know, for licensing. But there was this band once upon a time that emerged from some of the work he was doing and has reemerged. It sounds like it might be sort of a similar story for various reasons. One of the projects that he was doing for licensing, I guess, had a little momentum in terms of enthusiasm for perhaps playing out or recording an album. So I'm hoping that um, I need to take a look at what he's doing with that l very lately, but I'm, I'm hoping that uh, they're kind of doing, going down a similar path and, and creating some music because 
you know, I had to go to one of these uh, licensing libraries to listen to <laughs> some of these great recordings he's done. He sings on and plays guitar and writes. And, and I'm like, wow, none of this stuff's like anywhere to buy or, or, or stream or whatever. So that, that's a, a neat story. And then it looks like they followed up all good things with... Machine? Or, yeah, a release called Machine that, that tell me, was this one a little bit more of, okay, we're going to, we're going to do an album now as a, as a band. Okay. And, and maybe, uh, maybe there's some licensing, but the focus wasn't there. It was on doing a a band thing. Yeah. No, on the machines record, that's when we really kind of like decided, like, this is what, this is the image. This is the vibe. This is like, we're going to do the band thing. And so that's kind of like the, uh, the really like confident release as a band. And we shot a music video for the title track machines. So that's cool. It's kind of like a, you know, dark, dingy, you know, industrial gas mask kind of looking video. Very, very cool. A lot of fun to shoot. Dystopian. <laughs> I was going to ask you if you guys wear those respirators when you're on stage, when you're playing ever, but at least I can see them in the video, right? <laughs> Absolutely not. We got those for the video when for some press shots, um, just because it kind of like, it kind of captured just the image and just the whole vibe of the song, the kind of universe that we created as a band. But playing in those things is really hard, and we had to do that for the music video, and it was it was work. <laughs> we did that last because it's like you know you're you're putting yourself in like this like rubber glove pretty much. I'm gonna have to put that one in the um, in the show notes too for people to check out. It looks pretty cool. I can't wait to listen to those guys. And then um, let's let's switch gears to Paper Jackets. What are they doing on the release front? What have they done lately? They have. Oh, yeah, you mentioned Sticky. Sticky Icky. Or did you mention Sticky Icky? You sure did, yeah. Okay. And uh, and also Girl, um, that's another one. We also did a music video before those two. Uh, we had our first single kind of release on that album, and it was called Trigger, and we shot a really cool music video for that one, too. It was a, it was a music video that we shot on the back of, like, a truck. It was, like, a bed of a truck. Like, those, like, long, flat, flat bed things that you could tow around. And... Uh, we drove it around downtown, like Los Angeles, and we were on the back of it with our guitars. And it looks so it, like people would be like, "Is this a green screen? It looks like a green screen." It, and it wasn't. We, <laughs> we actually uh, we actually had the funding to kind of like put together this really cool thing. We had like a police escort, like to make sure we didn't get any wrecks. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. It's a, it's a really cool video. It does look like a green screen because of how like picturesque some of the shots look. We didn't really think about that. We're like, maybe this is going to look too good because it's like, it's kind of like, kind of trippy. Some of the angles are really cool. And, you know, it's like we're standing, but moving really fast down the street. Yeah, well, let people keep... Uh, Almost kind of like the Vanessa Carlton video. Yeah, yeah, kill. let people keep guessing how you did it. That's kind of cool. <laughs> I, I'll check that out. Yeah, it was a really kind of... It's one of those kind of like, it's interesting to watch kind of videos, whether you like the song or not. It's like, well, I, I kind of just want to see what's going on. Today. So you're... The fact that you have been involved in multiple projects probably for some time and some good ones, kind of guy for hire, but you, 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 the, these are steady gigs at the same time. You mentioned earlier that you uh, started networking in, in the LA area, went to that jam. Were there other things that you, you did or has it just been an exercise in an organic exercise or an exercise in organic relationship building that you've met people and, and, you know, you click, or has there been some other things that you can think of that you you've been doing to kind of keep yourself busy and in demand? Oh, well, you know, it's kind of a trial and error thing. I mean, like some people, I, I had to learn the hard way, you know, cause I did move here um, with just that one band kind of under my wing, right? It was just a good night. Hey, smart. You took your band. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I kind of I ditched I ditched my band in uh, in, in San Jose, and I, I came out to LA to be in this other band, and it was cool, it was great, you know, good people, but it was a lesson in don't put all of your eggs in one basket, or don't be spinning just one plate, you know what I mean? Because you know, as bands come and go, the good night did, uh, you know, it, members got busy, people got better gigs, and I was out of a band, you know, and I, I didn't really know anybody in LA for a little bit. So there was a couple of kind of like years of turmoil that I went through to kind of like get to this point where I was like, I have to do something. After a couple of years of, you know, the good night kind of not being banned anymore, I didn't really know anybody in LA. It was kind of like, oh man, what do I do? And, uh, you know, it was kind of like a pivotal moment in my life. 
where it's just like, you know, I lost the girlfriend, lost the cats, lost the apartment, had to find like a new place. And I was like, well, what am I going to do? You know, I'm not just going to move back to San Jose. Like I came here to do, to do music. So let's, let's lead with strength here and get this shit back on course. The first thing I did was at that point I was playing with the gutter daisies and uh, that was fun and it was great, but it was a band that wasn't, it, uh, it wasn't making me any money. It was a passion project. You know what I mean? So it was like, at that point it was like, Oh, cool. Well, let's, let's find some other people. So that's when I went to the sunset jam and I met, um, you know, I, I met some people from Paper Jackets and I realized that, you know, there are acts in town playing original music. Like, I, you know, I didn't have to be in a cover band. I could be in a band that was playing original music and I just needed a bass player. They're willing to pay a bass player to just kind of like do the thing that they needed to do. And I was like, yes, that's me. And uh, as I picked up that gig, it was like, okay, cool. Now I got two bands, right? I got Gutter Daisies, which is a passion project. And I got Paper Jackets, which is kind of like paying me and I really enjoy the music too. And then after about a couple months of doing that, my buddy Dan from The Good Night that, you know, that wasn't a band anymore, he hit me up. And that's when, you know, he made the the all good things proposition to me. And I was like, absolutely, you know, like, let's just add another plate to the mix. It's like, I'm never going to go back to one band ever again. And, uh, you know, he's such a good friend. I was like, absolutely, man. Um, And that's how I ended up with three. And it was like, you know, these two bands that were like, you know, that are kind of affording me this like extra income that I can live life that i've chose <laughs> yeah and i i saw it looks like not too long ago uh, this year you had an opportunity for i thought it was just one of your bands but for two of your bands to do what i believe was an opening gig for both with x ambassadors which is must have been kind of cool those guys are pretty widely known as um, did i get that part right it was actually paper jackets and gutter daisies uh, no actually it was just paper jackets uh paper jackets went out and uh yeah and it was in uh it was in Arizona and it was great. It was a really fun night. Those guys are really talented and they're really nice dudes. And it was a great crowd. Oh man, Paper Jackets, we, would, we love playing for big crowds. Man. It's, it's a, there's a lot of people in that band, so it's a whole lot of energy. It's a whole lot of sound. And I feel like that's one of those bands that's like, it's made for a big stage. And that, that was a really fun night. We, we, did, we, did a, we did a pretty good job, I'd like to think. <laughs> awesome. How, how did that gig come about? Does someone know someone or what happened? Well, that was something where, like, Paper Jackets has been trying to, like, really nail the radio circuit. And uh, yeah, I think a couple months prior to that, we we played, like, a radio thing. Uh, it was, like, a radio conference where, like, you, you go out to Las Vegas and you play this venue. And they've flown out a bunch of these radio personalities to kind of, like, oh, these are a bunch of, like, new bands, local bands, up-and-coming bands that we've uh, nominated to be here. You know, they kind of just they hang out and have some drinks, watch some bands, and if they see anything they like, they could start spinning these new bands on their radio stations. They could stay on top of the new, the new wave. And uh, we played a couple of those. We played one of those in Los Angeles. We played one of those uh, in Las Vegas. And, uh, you know, we come and we put our best foot forward, and I feel like we made some good impressions. And through that event, I think we made some friends in the Las Vegas, Nevada area. And uh, we have a really great manager. His name's David Breer. Uh, great dude. And uh, he's been kind of like helping us put these things together and kind of like get these uh, get these great gigs that he knows that we can knock out of the park at. And uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of how we got that gig. It was just through trying to play out, trying to uh, play less dive bar shows and play more straight up like let's go to a radio station let's meet the meet the djs shake some hands play some acoustic sets and kind of like try to try to get into the market that way i was going to say you mentioned your your manager david can you talk a little bit about the kind of things that um and and is that is the manager for paper jackets right for paper jackets yeah can you talk about some of the kind of things that he does for you guys well i mean aside from keep us all on track because like i think i've had like a handful of managers and i do air quotes here that are just you know they would love to tell you they just they just love to tell you what they think you want to hear and they're not good managers but uh where where david kind of breaks that is he he's actually you know putting in work he's he's making calls to these radio stations he's kind of like really kind of like putting our feet to the fire on some of these things like hey you know you guys got to get this set up to like 45 minutes for this one gig or like uh you know just making sure that we're up to snuff and kind of like getting it, uh, everything done. And he'll fly out to gigs to, you know, see us and everything and kind of make sure everything is going well. I know that my singer, James, the singer from Paper Jackets, he, he's always like in contact with David. So I know that like, 
James would probably have a lot more to say about David than I do, but I just know that he's like, he's keeping us all on the right path. You know, he's making these phone calls to these people that are, you know, having us come out and play. So that's, that's really big to kind of have somebody in your corner to kind of just be somebody who, who's going to organize things for you. That's, that's not in the band. I need to speak on behalf. This was through a trial and error. We've had some bad management. And I think um, my singer, James, he, uh, you know, there's a lot of really good bands in this area. It's Los Angeles. There's a lot of up and coming bands. So, you know, through meeting people and word of mouth, David has kind of, uh, I'm pretty sure he's, he's helped out a few bands that, that I listen to. I don't know if I want to name any names because I don't, I don't want to get it wrong. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. But, uh, I, I, but he's, you know, he's worked with some acts that I, that I respect. And so I think that was what tipped us off to, oh, maybe we should contact him and see if he would like to manage us. And, uh, you know, he came to a rehearsal, came out to a gig, and, you know, agreed to, you know, start this, you know, this plan with us. This was like one year plan, two year plan, like getting, getting this band off the ground in the right, you know, starting with like really like small gigs when we were just kind of like developing our sound and then eventually just kind of like getting us out to these radio conferences and then now getting us out to these flyaway dates where like, you know, after playing all these radio shows, we get to play with X ambassadors. We get to, you know, this weekend we get to go out to Wisconsin for a festival and play with the red jumpsuit apparatus. And, like that's, that's really cool. That's it's, it's a lot of fun. Wisconsin. That's awesome. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, Wisconsin. <laughs> I have friends from there, and inevitably they they live up to the uh, to the accent, the stereotypical accent. Lovely people. Who's the band that you're going to play with there? That's going to be Paper Jackets in Wisconsin. Uh, no, the one you said you you guys were going to do a gig with. Oh, oh, it's a Red Jumpsuit Apparatus. I've not heard of them. Uh, they were a band that are, uh, they were really big into like uh, kind of like the emo scene, the early 2000s. And I think that like their big song was a song called Face Down. And uh, yeah, they were kind of like a scene band back in the day. They were like that emo band that like kind of broke through for a minute. Um, I don't know what they've been doing since, but I'm sure they're going to bring a nice crowd to uh, this festival. And... Cool. Yeah, cool. I, in Wisconsin, I will check them out. I'm, it's possible I've heard the song, so I wasn't familiar with the name. There's so many freaking artists now available to our ears, you know, on the in the on the, via the internet these days. It's changed so yeah, much. Yeah, I know it's a deluge of artists and sounds and things you have to remember and people that don't put vowels in their names and <laughs> or not enough. Yeah, that's funny. There's, there's a lot out there. <laughs> yep, indeed. Well, that's cool. What is on the, let's see, we're coming into the fourth quarter. What's on the horizon for next year? Can you see what's going to happen for for you musically or something that you're hoping is going to happen? Well, um, I mean, it's really kind of a waiting game and, and a gamble because I've got a lot of stuff going on with Paper Jackets and I've got this, I've got a label thing going on with All Good Things. So it's really a, manage, a matter of uh, who's going to book me first. <laughs> So with paper jackets, it's uh, we've got like a one year plan to kind of get this thing off the ground and just start, you know, uh, playing consistent gigs. And I feel like we've been doing well. We've been playing the right gigs. We've been making the right impressions. And, you know, in a year we want to be touring regularly to, you know, kind of get our name out there, get off the ground, start making some money, making a real name for ourselves. So that's the plan for that band. And we've got a uh, we've got another album on deck that we've recorded and uh, it's ready to go. We've got a couple of music videos that we're going to release, too. Paper Jackets is going to release a music video in October for this song called Ghost of You. It's really cool. We shot it while we were on tour in New York. And it's a, it's a really cool, trippy, kind of darker video for that band specifically. But, you know, it's coming out in October. It's going to be very thematic. It's that whole month and the whole vibe of October. So that's cool. I'm excited for that and just continually releasing music with Paper Jackets throughout the you know the rest of this year and seeing where that takes us. Now, simultaneously, <laughs> uh, I've been working with All Good Things and uh, they're working on getting signed to 11.7. And uh, that's, that's a pretty cool rock label that uh, they seem to be doing a lot of really good things for some of these rock bands out there. Um, I think uh, Motley Crue is on the label, uh, the band that I really like, Nothing More. Nothing more is on this label. You know, when you're working with a label, there's different timelines. It's not like a band where you could just like make decisions and do things in a day. Uh, we're trying to strategize with the label and see what songs they want to put on this next album. You know, what kind of things we can do to make it kind of just like 
the perfect product for them and uh, hopefully go on tour. That's the goal. But with them, we're kind of embroiled in this, you know, writing the best songs we can and trying to just kind of like crank out music so we can get the best of the best on this album, release it, and then uh, uh, hopefully have that label push us real hard and get us out on the road. I just don't know what's going to happen first, you know? And I've talked to both bands. Everybody, I play a really straightforward game with all the bands that I play in, and it's like, look, like, you know, I'm a musician that's working just like you, and I'm going to take the best gigs that I can when they come to me. So if I get booked out, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, you know, I try to make myself as available as possible for uh, as many of these groups as I can just because uh, it's all friends you know it's all love I don't work with anybody that I wouldn't want to hang out with and you know therefore there's yeah there's no bad blood and everybody understands where I'm coming from so it, it really is kind of a it's kind of a race it's kind of a gamble and uh, yeah, I make time for everyone and the whole time I'm working on gutter daisy stuff you know, because that's the project where it's like, you know, when I get home from a long day of work, I kind of just take a nice you know, deep breath. And like those songs that come out are, it, you know, it's, it's the most natural thing for, for us three. So that's kind of like, you know, at the end of the day, we have the gutter daisies. And that's kind of like this, like this underlying passion project. That, like no matter what happens, I'll always have that band. And <laughs> that's awesome. That's great. The Gutter Daisies have, uh, we've, we've, we're, we've been working on a couple songs with uh, Matt Wallace, who's, uh, who's done Sugar Cult. Um, I think he's, he did uh, songs about Jane, uh, the one early Maroon 5 record. And so we've got a couple of songs that we recorded with him that he's kind of like working on. I think we're about to get the masters on those. And I'm really excited about that. But like, it's just a matter of spinning those three plates. So it's kinda, <laughs> it sounds a little bit more complicated than it is. But I don't know, I've kind of you know, you know, sectioned it off in my mind. As a gigging musician, it, this really kind of sped up for me when I was living in San Jose. I was working with multiple projects, so I can kind of relate. You're doing it at a, uh, arguably a different level because you're doing it with original artists and you've immersed yourself in music. But I get it. It's a game of uh, juggling schedules and, and uh, trying to support everyone. And it's great that you're working with people, keeping it limited to people that you enjoy being with. That's the way to do it. Okay, so... I think uh, probably one of the best things for me to tell listeners about as far as learning about all these things that you're working on is to look for you on Instagram, and it's Miles Franco. Did I say your last name right? I was supposed to ask that before we started. Uh, yes, that is uh, <laughs> and, Miles, uh, Miles Franco. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's amazing how people can mess up some of the simplest names, and I understand mine isn't the simplest, but no, you did not get it wrong. Thank you. It's a, it's a Miles underscore Franco on, uh, on Insta. That's the handle. Yep, and I think that you'll see um, Splinter's off to most of his work. It's probably worth mentioning that because Paper Jackets is pretty easy to find. And uh, and actually, you know, I think the one place I, I find all three of them very easily, and I hope that nobody dislikes me for this, but um, is Spotify. So Paper Jackets, uh, All Good Things, and The Gutter Daisies in my recent searches now all show up very nicely there so you can hear... Um, hear all the music and then you guys are all on social it looks like but uh, I would highly recommend you look for Miles on Instagram and, and kind of see some of the stuff he's up to Miles thank you so much for spending time with me I think this is going to be uh, another cool episode and I wish you the best of luck with all three projects and whatever else happens to come your way Oh, thank you so much for having me it's been a pleasure Hey, thanks again for listening. If you are loving the podcast, please visit unstarvingmusician.com forward slash crowd sponsor to learn about the various ways that you can offer your support. And again, if you're a listener, I consider you a supporter, especially if you shared it with a friend. Thank you. Have you heard of Banzoogle? Yep, they're powering websites for musicians all over the world. Their easy system will get you online fast. They have tons of mobile-friendly templates to help you custom to design your site and content. It's built for musicians by musicians. They make it easy to sell merch, grow your email list, integrate your socials, and they offer support from a musician-friendly team seven days a week. Plans are affordable. Go to banzoogle.com to start a free trial, and be sure to use the promo code Robonzo to get 15% off your first year. That's banzoogle.com, promo code Robonzo, R-O-B-O-N-Z-O. Look for show notes and links to most everything mentioned in this episode at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash podcast. Thanks so much for listening. With a whole lot of gratitude, peace, love, and more cowbell. <laughs>